Woof. Well, guys, that was not a dream. You did witness that brilliant Grand Prix in Italy. Absolutely incredible from Formula One. Who said F1 was boring? We certainly didn't. I don't think we did anyway. Anyway, so that was then. Let's look forward to the third race in this absolutely amazing triple headers that we are having. The third triple header, and this is the third race of that third triple header, if that makes any sense to you guys. We're going to Mugello on Sunday for the first time in Formula 1 history. Can't wait for that. But, as we always do in our channel, we always start the week with agree or disagree. We absolutely love this series. Thank you so much to everyone who did send in their opinions. Commiserations if yours didn't make it. We did get quite a lot about one certain person, which will obviously you will be able to say about this. But anyways, let's waste let's waste no more time into this. Let's jump into it. Lyle, what is the first opinion on this week's agree or disagree? So the first opinion comes in from Sam Ogara and he says Bottas is a slightly above driver and only looked good because Mercedes are incredible. And to that, obviously there's a lot of talk about Bottas finishing in P5, mm -hmm. two positions above the man who finished in last place, who came from the back to P7, Lewis Hamilton, his teammate. So to that, I'm going to say, mm, agree. I'm actually going to say disagree to that. Oh, I mean, again, Bottas, you know, there's a lot of debate about what's going on with him. You can't compare him to Hamilton, of course. You cannot compare him to his teammate, for sure. Um, but... That's the thing, you know, especially just taking off, off Monda because, you know, of course, we have to talk about the race, the recent race. You know, Lewis Hamilton comes from the front, get 10 second penalty for pitting under when the pit lane was shut under the safety car, goes to the back of the grid and then finishes the race in P7 and sets a fastest lap. When his teammate Valerie Bottas falls from P2 with no problems, he claimed a puncher, but no problems in that race for him. He fell from mm -hmm. P2 all the way back to P5 and that's where he finished getting, of course, beaten by the two McLaren drivers and the racing point driver of Lance Stroll, who, of course, finished on the podium and the race winner, a certain Pierre Gasly. Um, that's the thing I'm looking at, and I'm thinking, is he really the right person to, you know, be at Mercedes? Um, of course, Mercedes is good, so when he churns out the points, you know, normally he wins the first race, like he did last year in Australia. He won the first race in this year as well, if you can remember, all the way back, which God, feels like an eternity ago, doesn't it? The that first, does. The wow. first race, yeah, in Austria. Wow. Um, back then when we were worried about the season, obviously now 17 races and past halfway now. Anyways, um, so he wins the first race, and of course, yeah, P2 normally, most likely a trip to the podium. I think he's finished on the podium every time, bar, of course, uh, Monza. Um, you know, good in the, in the constructors, and he's there to finish P, P2 in, for Mercedes. P1 in the constructors and P2 in the drivers support Lewis Hamilton and get them the points. And of course, the Mercedes car is making him look like a very good driver. And that's, a th you know, on in positions like Monza, in race like Monza, we do see the, the performance of Valerie. The alone in the water, you know, his teammate isn't there. Mercedes aren't really, they haven't got the heads screwed on completely because in this instance, they're all focused on Lewis Hamilton, who, as I say, you know, is fighting through the pack. It's not incredibly hard for Lewis to do, but, you know, Overtaking wasn't great. That power unit was just okay. Mercedes, you know, it's not the best track for him in terms of straight line speed. Of course, they do a lot better at other circuits. Monda is actually one of the, probably not the worst, but not the best for Mercedes this season. Um, so as Lewis was fighting through, he had all the, the brains at Mercedes focusing on him. Really, no one was there to help Valtteri. It, it was all down to how Valtteri drives. Of course, he was chasing Lando Norris. He was chasing the podium positions, getting beaten by you know lower down drivers in slower cars. wasn't helping him at all, and that's where we really saw the performance of Valtteri. Could he get a performance back for Mercedes? If anything, it's kind of like um, you know I don't know being the the second in command and your first in command of you know drops out or you know you're the substitute teacher and you're going to step up and the, when the teacher's ill you know you have the opportunity to really perform really really well and get the result for your team number two driver in a number one position he can get the position for mercedes if he gets on the podium he's a sole mercedes on the podium even though lewis has a good race valerie's you know he's called back for mercedes they haven't hurt as much in the constructors i mean of course no one's going to cast him but they haven't hurt as much and they've you know they've saved themselves some face in this weekend after what's happened but instead he didn't do that you know a p5 and i mean i know that mclaren those mclarens had pace for sure but P5, really, for Valtteri? So I completely agree with this statement. Um, and, and, and we're going to see that in the next few races. If Mugello, if that car is incredibly strong, like it always is, Lewis will finish P1, Valtteri will finish P2. But if it's okay, we know Lewis, or we think Lewis is going to get the performance. We know that he's going to wrestle that car at the best of his positions. Ergo, coming from, was it, 17th to, uh, as a P7 and the fastest lap. 
But again, yeah. if value's in this position, we really don't know what we're going to see. Mm -hmm. And again, when you make your pro positions, it's only, we'll put value in P2, only if that Mercedes car is good. So I completely agree with that statement. But John, you said disagree. I did. Very strange. Uh, so yes, I mean, of course, Mercedes is the best car ever. But why do you disagree with this statement? Well, he said in the in, in a statement that the car is making Bottas look better. I think being at Mercedes is making Bottas look not as good as what he actually is. Now, definitely 100% Bottas, he hasn't really exactly set the world alight since going to Mercedes. But he's only there for one reason. That's to play number two to Lewis Hamilton. That's all he's there for. Now, is the, the guy who we replaced, Nick Rosberg, ultimately beat Lewis Hamilton in 2016. It took him two years to do it. Close in 14, quite far away in 15. But 16, he eventually did it. But there was a lot of altercations between those two. They kept running into each other. There was a lot of hitty words in the media. It didn't look good for the Mercedes. So for the Mercedes brand and the Mercedes team and the sponsors. So ultimately, they had to get someone in who is who is not going to beat Lewis Hamilton, essentially. Who is not going to be the next best driver coming through the ranks or the best driver on the grid at present. Because there was rumours that oh, Verstappen was going to be going to Mercedes. And I fell for that. But thinking about it, I was like, why would Mercedes get someone in again to just to cause more trouble. Because if you bring Verstappen into that seat, there, there, there is going to be trouble. 100%. So Mercedes don't want that. And, you know, Bottas, it, it's, it definitely, like, like what Lau said there, his performance on Sunday, he should have been, he should have won that race 100%. He should have been that one to pick up the pieces where Lewis is down. And Bottas has done that in some races over the years. He has been the one to be there when Lewis is down. But also, at the same time, he hasn't been. So you've got to kind of question going, well, you know, what is he actually, what is he doing? What is the future for Bottas? I think if you put him in a, in a midfield car, let's say, or even a car, or even give him the number one role, I think he'll do a lot better than what he is doing right now. I honestly believe this. Because being in the shadow of Lewis Hamilton is, it's no, it's no easy task for anybody. You put anyone in that Mercedes, you put George Russell in that Mercedes, would, would he have won that race in Italy? I, honestly, I really don't know. Possibly, he could have done better than Bottas, but we never know. Um, and like this the whole thing whole thing with Albon having the worst car than Verstappen, I would say that maybe Mercedes, maybe not as extreme, but certainly have the best part. Lewis Hamilton's car is 100% better than Bottas's car. But I'm not saying but that's the reason why Bottas is so far behind and Lewis is so far ahead. You know, Hamilton's just a different breed of driver. He's, he's, un, he's unbelievable. And Bottas, he, I would say certainly he's a better driver than what he actually has shown right now. I mean, in, in his Williams days, he beat Massa three years in a row, a very well-experienced driver in the same car, and, and a car that was very quick, to, you know, to say the least, and at a time where Mercedes were unstoppable, like, unreal, like, how good that how good that, that car was, and how, how, how good it is still. Um, and he did well there, 100%, and rightly so, got the drive at Mercedes. He won three races in his debut year, which is brilliant. 2018 was a winless year. He was a bit unlucky in some races, but certainly his performances were nowhere near where they want, where they should have been. But realistically, he's not there to win championships. He's not there to beat Lewis. He's there to support Lewis, to support the team, to essentially be there when Lewis is down or, or for whatever reason. Yes, he wasn't yeah. there on uh, on Sunday, but I would say you know maybe, maybe that was just like a one-off for whatever reason. He's just he's just not performing. But his, his performance in Austria, like we've seen in recent years, have been very, very good. And that's, for me, that's showing how good that how good Bottas is. But for some yeah. reason, it's either, is Bottas doing worse than what he should be doing, or is Hampton doing better because he's on this mindset of, you know, you know, you know what Lewis is like when he's in, when he's in that zone. Like, he's, you're not, you're not going to beat him. You're not going to yeah. beat him. And now he's got that record in target, in, in sight. You know, he's, he's going for it. Whether he says it in the media or not, it's in. He he can see it. He knows he's got it. Yeah. Very close to anyway. So, is that is that down to it? I really don't know. I'm I'm not the drivers, but certainly I would say Bottas. Yes, he's not performing, but certainly I would say he is a better driver than what he is giving credit for. A hundred percent. So, anyways, moving on to the next opinion, and it comes in from Mark, um, a guy who we've actually done a collaboration with uh, when he was part of F1 Fanatics on this big Christmas quiz that we did at the end of 2019. Very nice guy as well, and he's an Aussie. Well done. Um, and he says, and he's a big fan of the feeder series, by the way. And now this is like a feeder series opinion. He says, Teal Porcher is, is is destined for F1 and would have already won the title already, sorry, if he was in the Prima. Now, Teal Porcher is almost like this, like, 
next up and coming French French driver in the lower ranks. And to this, I'm going to say agree. I'm going to say disagree. Now, I've just started following Formula Three. I wasn't really that keen on it when it when I was really getting into the lower ranks. I've just started watching Formula Two, so I was like, mm, well, with with the calendar the way it is, F2 and F3, I've been at the same races up until you know throughout the majority of the season. Well, all the races this weekend coming up is actually the last race of the Formula Three season. Formula Two ends in Sakia, I think, one week uh, before the real life. F before real life F1 season, the, the F1 season ends. Uh, I think Porsche has a chance of the title. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure he's in that grasp of winning it. Uh, he's got like a really outside chance. He's, he's what, third in the standings behind the two premiers of Piastri and Sargent. So I think they're hot favourites, but Porsche has a good chance of winning that title. And he's only just started single-seater racing as well. His past two series he's done, which is... French F4 in 2018, he won, which is his debut year in single seat there. And is it AD, what is it, AD, ADAC? Is that right? ADS, ADAC F4 last season? He won that. And then this is the first season, his first season in, in Formula 3. And that Prima car, who won the, the the team's championship or the constructors' championship, you know, they, they've certainly 100% got the best car. Uh, poor chairs in the ART, I believe, which is a good car, but Prima in the lower ranks are a very impressive team. And if he was in that car, you know, he's, he's won three races already, or two no, two races this season, and about six podiums, I think. So he certainly, he's got the skill, he's an exciting driver, he had a brilliant race um, at the Italian Grand Prix, uh, which was absolutely carnage, by the way, in Formula 3. If you didn't watch it, I would highly recommend doing so. Really, really good. Um, just Cars spinning everywhere. It was like Sebastian Vettel. It was like loads of little Sebastian Vettels. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I've just really got to. I had to put that in there. I'm so sorry, Vettel fans. Forgive me. Anyways, uh, don't send us hate, please. Uh, we're getting up. We're getting up for that anyway. Um, so yeah, not anyway. Back on the poor chair. Like he's certainly an up and coming talent. Formula One worthy, a hundred percent. But you know, we have seen it in the past though, where drivers have done really well in the lower ranks, got into Formula, like, even Formula Two, and just fell off the pace. And it's like. Well, what, you know, what's happened to this guy? Even get to Formula 1 and just crumbled un under the pressure or even gone into a really bad car and your teammate is a multiple world champion who likes to complain over team radio. And I'm obviously talking about Stoffel Van Dorn who, whose junior career was sensational yet to get the McLaren it didn't work. So, poor Cech could be one of those drivers who just fails, was a promising young driver and fails. But certainly, as from what I'm saying right now, he's got the potential to be in Formula, in Formula 1 but I want to see him in Formula Two first, 100%, and see how he does there, and see if he's, you know, if he's got the capabilities of challenging, you know, better drivers in faster cars. But certainly, 100%, um, Tio Porcher has definitely got a future in Formula One. Uh, Lal, you said uh, disagree to this. Tio Porcher, not not quite a Formula One yet. Well, at some point in the future. Why is that? Yeah. Well, I mean, firstly, French drivers absolutely loved at the moment, Pierre Gasly for sure. Um, now, again, obviously, um, you know, a lot of these drivers in Formula 2, Formula 3 and beyond that definitely have the passion to get to Formula 1. And to, to the question, it's it's disagree for now. You know, I'm not saying that in the next five years he possibly won't. But, you know, it's very, very hard to get into Formula 1, just if, you, if you didn't know that. You know, it's not as easy just to walk yeah. in. Um, <laughs> you know... And, you know, it's, it's been said on, on the radio, it's been said before that, you know, we have drivers, you know, we have we don't have any teammates at the moment, but of course we have Lance Stroll, um, Lando yeah. Norris, Max Verstappen, even, you know, over the years, Sebastian Vettel, Lewis Hamilton, they were insanely young, but now we are seeing some insanely young drivers, Max was 17, and I think when Lando came in, he was just like one of those drivers where it really hits you back, especially when me and Jordan, are, you know, we're, well, we were younger than, than Max, I think Esteban, I think Esteban Ocken was the first one that came in. He was, he's about a month older than me. He's younger than Jordan, he's about a month older than me. So I'm like, you know, driver, he's my age, fair enough. Then Max comes in 11 months younger than, no, he does not, sorry, he's September 97. So he's about half a month younger than us. Um, and then now we've got these drivers who are like four, I think three or four years younger. Lando Norris is, you know, 20 and, and I'm 23. It's ridiculous. It really it's is. Scary. And, you know, these drivers, I think once you hit the older ages, you know, you kind of, you don't have a shot. There's a lot of younger drivers. There's a lot of better drivers out there in Formula 2 as well. And, you know, there's only 26 in Formula 1 at the moment. And, of course, in Formula 2, not everyone's going to get there. We're only looking at the top few. It's very, to be honest, it really, it's, it's a championship to the Premier League. You know, and only three teams from the championship go up. It's insanely hard. You've got to win. 
you've got to come a very close second. And then, of Unless course, you go into the fun. playoffs, which are... <laughs> Uh, and then you go into the playoffs, which are, to be honest, they say the playoffs are the most expensive and most exciting, you know, few games yeah. at Wembley you'll ever see because these teams are really given 110,000% to get up there. Anyway, that was a bit of a tangent, sorry. Um, you know, so again, not everyone from Formula 2 is going to get there. You know, we're talking about Schwartzman, uh, Eilat, uh, uh, Joe, um uh, Sonoda, Schumacher, of course. We're looking at all them, but you know, only a select few are going to get there. And people in Formula 3 are really going to have to bite the tongues at the moment and think, when is our chance going to come? And unfortunately, it might never do that. Something really special has got to be pulled out of the bag. You've got to win these categories, especially Formula 3. You've got to win them very, very fast, like we've seen some of these drivers do. You know, Charles Leclerc, Max Verstappen, Ocon, Hamilton, even people in for who have been in Formula 2, you know, like Louis Delatraz, and of course, uh, the late Antoine Hubert, winning Formula 3 in their first first or even second season at a push getting into Formula 2 impressing and then moving up and if you're in Formula 3 for over a year or two then really your chances aren't very good so I do think that of course he has got a good chance as well um, you know French drivers are definitely few and far between in terms of being on the podium of course you'll know um, uh, Fier Gasly was the first driver in 24 years Olivia Panis back in 96 he was the last I French driver to do stat. this on a, on a and, random note I couldn't believe that stat when they, when they said and, that <laughs> Wow. I know it's incredible. I mean, that was before I was born as well. It's absolutely incredible. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think, he, yeah, hopefully he does get there. And I would, to be honest, I would like to brand everyone there. You just mentioned there as well, Jordan, Logan, Logan Sargent, uh, you know, brilliant guy. I haven't followed his racing career, but I remember he did follow me on Instagram for about a few months. Real story. <laughs> he actually did as well. He followed us. And then, uh, I don't know, I think I was checking my Instagram and I was like, people, it was one of those apps and it was like, people who have unfollowed us, Logan Sargent. What? I was like, oh, oh. So, Logan, Sergeant. if you're watching, please follow me back. I'll send you my Instagram. <laughs> um, awesome. Even if even this channel will do, please. Um, so, yes, anyway, I mean, I would like to see, of course, CEO get to Formula 1, but it's very, very hard to do so. And I think at the moment it is definitely a disagree because, as I say, we are looking at these Formula 2 drivers who might not get there. You know, Callum Eilat and Robert Schwartzman are insanely, insanely skilled. Uh, mm -hmm. Mick Schumacher as well, but only really one or two of them could get through as it is very much like the championship to the Premier League and if in our case much 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 more entertaining and even much more harder because that gap is insanely you know only one driver two at the most squeeze into F1 I mean look at last year you know only Latifi gets in it's absolutely incredible so we'll have to see what happens there anyways moving on to uh, the third statement for today and it comes in from Turk Aiden 4-4 this isn't about Pierre Gasly. Um, I'm going to have to keep saying that. <laughs> uh, and this is uh, a pretty good one, actually. It is um, it's a shocking result uh, that turned into a great race. Don't really know about that, but it's probably not a Gasly fan. Um, it was just a DRS train, and passing was damn near impossible, even with DRS. Those extra engine settings are important to get around other cars. DRS, of course, zones to help overtake. And, um, and to that, I'm going to say... Do you know what? I'm actually going to say agree. I'm also going to say agree. Um, as I say, you know, some tracks really show DRS to the best of its ability. Drag adjustment system, of course, if you don't know. Um, the front, the rear wing opens if you're in within one second of the car in front. And, you know, some of these tracks, some tracks we see and the DRS is absolutely incredible. Of course, we're not going there this year, but Shanghai was a big one on the back straight as well. Some of these streets, so it's like Baku, you could really see the detection there. Also, Austria, Spain, there's a lot of tracks that, as I say, show DRS in its good form. But Monza, a very high speed circuit, it sometimes is quite hard in terms of overtaking. Um, when you go to qualifying on Saturday, that's definitely the first kind of indication you can see. Cars depend on slipstream of course getting in the clean air of the cars but they are very hard to pass and the, the cars do expel a lot of dirty air also um in terms of you know what you might be able to see in the race towards the last few laps carlos was gaining on gasly but in terms of the you know between lap 50 and 53 you know when carlos was getting in to, you know close to a, th a second he did get in under a second, I think it was lap 52 and then lap 53. And even with DRS that he did have about three or four times, you know, towards the end, he just couldn't pass him. You know, I don't know if that was because of the dirt, yeah, that he was inside the car, but that DRS not help. And I mean, don't get me wrong, the DRS, of course, does add a lot in. If you're in, let's say, nine, let's say you're, you know, 0.9 of a second behind at the start of the, the straight in Monza with DRS, you probably will be 0.7 at the end. It really, really does help, of course. 
Uh, and of course, in the just going off the second Lesmo as well, going down to this uh, Escari chicane, definitely, I would say that helps a little bit more. But again, Monza, that high speed circuit, it doesn't have the impact. And the problem is as well is because DRS, as I say, you know, let's use as I've just said then there, Baku, you know, very 90 degree corners. You're coming out of there, you know, in second gear, it's slow corners. And then you hit DRS, it really, really helps, you know, get that speed up and you can outbreak them and stuff like that. But Monza is yeah. such a high speed circuit, you know, especially coming on the main straight, it doesn't help that much. And we didn't see that many passing as well. And you might think that, you know, the, the, the top cars couldn't pass each other. But even the top cars on the slow on the slow drivers, on the slow cars, the cars that are less aerodynamically, you know, possessed, it wasn't the best for them, of course. Um, Ferrari, you know, as a Ferrari, they have said that, you know, the drag and the aerodynamics of that car is really, really bad. And again, that was struggling. But even that was struggling compared to these, you know, the Mercedes car, which, of course, is being made to promote aerodynamics in the McLaren as well. They were struggling also. The, the overtaking wasn't great around Monza. It was an amazing race, of course, for sure. Uh, there was definitely some of overtaking, of course, but you look at things like the late braking, and of course, again, with Monza, there isn't many late braking opportunities. The second Lesmo, probably the you know one of the biggest late braking you can get, of course, the chicane at the start. Uh, the Scari chicane, uh, the Sakari, I can't say that, the uh, Ascari chicane, Ascari. depending on, of course, the braking zone there, yeah, of course. But um, yeah, it, it, the DRS wasn't, a massive help around there. So, Jordan, you of course also also say agree. Um, just kind of moving into the real world as well, because again, I, you know, we didn't, I didn't really get your thoughts about on Sunday. Those last few laps, Science versus Gasly, he was gaining, but yeah, did you know? Did DRS not help him as much as you would have thought? Because once he was inside the zone, you thought you must have thought he was going to get him. So, I mean, yeah, yeah, you you agree with that statement? And what was the last few laps like for you? It was tense. It was thrilling. I wanted. Gasly to win certainly, but I was probably apart. From, I I might have been the only person in in England, unless you've got Spanish relations, that wasn't rooting for for uh, uh, Pierre Gasly. I was rooting for Carlos yeah. Sainz because I wanted him to win because it's a McLaren. But anyways, no Gasly won, and that was absolutely incredible. Um, I kind of went a bit overboard with my reaction in the uh, race reaction video, but certainly that's how I felt, and that's how I'm gonna express it. A hundred percent. I mean, what a thrilling end. Um. Um, yeah, the reason why I'm agreeing with this is because, you know, the, we all know that, that these cars, these modern generation of cars, they're very hard to follow. And certainly, it can hinder overtaking by, um, you know, getting enough slipstream. You're in the, the car's dirty air, which caused a lot of overheating problems, which the Mercedes, once again, they were, they suffered from this. Uh, Bottas, again, he was told to stay out of, stay out of um, the slipstream on some occasions. I think it was like turns 10 and 11 or towards the end of the lap. That, that's where it was critical for the heat. And Bottas was, you know, it, I'd imagine he wasn't that impressed. So certainly that's what hoping that these new 2022, 2022 regulations sort out and we do get a bit of closer racing. Um, and in DRS, that, that has helped. Um, and you think that on a track like Monza, there would be good, it would be good opportunities for overtaking because there's loads of straights, very little corners. Um, and yeah, we did see a big DRS train, but they couldn't get close enough because, like I said, the slipstream it it's not really that powerful um, at Monza, uh, which is very which is really frustrating. Cause we wanted to see um, you know uh, a lot of overtaking, a lot of close action, uh, but this is more so with the engine modes more than the DRS, in my opinion, because this weekend marked the the first weekend of where uh, teams can only have one engine map uh, in qualifying and the race. If they, once they choose that map in qualifying, they have to stick with it throughout the course of the race. They can't go down and they can't go up. It's as simple as that. And Bottas was very vocal about this on Team Radio by saying that he can't race in this mode. Relating back to what I said earlier about the Bottas opinion, was that mainly down to maybe him, Bottas, not being able to, to perform? I mean, Lewis went from back to the grid at 7th, so no. But anyways, but I would say that if the engine modes were allowed and they, were, they weren't... They um, were the the set well the the rule that it was in place which is like the, the same rule for qualifying in the race the same set in in both sessions um you know if they if you had the old rule where like you can just go to any any engine setting you want maybe we could have had a closer finish at the front between Gasly and Sainz you had a feeling that if Gasly sorry if Sainz didn't send it in a, into one or even in, into three at all turns four I keep you know uh, the curve of Grande is technically turn three um in in the four for the next chicane then he's not going to win the race because he's not going to overtake him. Unless he wants to be ballsy and go trying to overtake Adescari, but 
Yeah. No, thank you. Um, you know Gasly was going to win, which was brilliant, but at the same time, you were like, I really want a, a neck and neck finish. Um, but but in saying that, though, to counteract what I just said, if the engine modes had have been available, I can guarantee you, Lewis Hamilton would have won that race because of how quickly he came through that pack with the engine mode he had. Mm-hmm. And we know, how, we know how quick that Mercedes engine is and how you know how good it is um, and how powerful it is and certainly he, he might have caught them and then he wouldn't have, we we wouldn't have had the grandstand finish like we did so it's it's good and bad but certainly th- th- there are good and bad things about this about this engine mode thing we've seen it on on sunday how it obviously didn't pan the reason for the engine mode wasn't because of the results but certainly we could have had a better better race racing wise if the en- those engine modes were available but like i said maybe we wouldn't have got the Gasly win. We could have got the Hamilton win. Maybe Gasly P2 and Sainz P3. Or even someone else in P3. Could have been Verstappen if he was in the race. Of course, he retired with, with their engine problems. But, never, nevertheless. Uh, yeah, and anyways, let us know what you think about the, about these new engine settings in the comment section below as well. So, anyways. Moving on to the to the next opinion. And it's that guy, once again, you there. He comes in with another opinion. Wow. I mean, you there. I love your opinions, my friend. Yeah. Uh, Amazing, incredible. <laughs> um, he says, if Renault want a French driver in their team, then they should replace Ocon with Gasly. Uh, Gasly is a, is the superior driver and is a much nicer person to work with. Ocon is toxic. Incredible. Uh, Gasly should avoid the Red Bull team at all costs. He doesn't seem comfortable there. Once again, use air going for... Loads of different directions with this opinion. Like, where do we go? Are we going for Renault? Are we going for Red Bull? What, what's this? Uh, you know, Gasly is the man of the moment right now. Um, but to this, I'm going to say agree. Um, firstly, Yuzay is a top man. Actually, my statement is um, I want a lot of you guys to be like Yuzay. Give us some very juicy statements. <laughs> I say, as, as John said, that guy is always there. Um, He's always there. Obviously, I'll explain. I'll, yeah, for sure. I'll explain why, of course. But I'm going to say agree to that also. Yeah, I think it's pretty straightforward there because Gasly certainly has turned a corner since going back to Alfa Tori. He really has. And we've seen a different driver. And, and for a lot of people, they are his driver of the season. I would certainly believe that Gasly is in that bracket of driver of the season contenders along with yeah. Lando Norris and, and Lance Stroll, certainly. Um, and when he was at Red Bull, we've seen how poor and how down Gasly was. I and mean, It was very vocal in Drive to Survive. Um and certainly Christian Horner and Helm Marco, they weren't impressed with how Gasly was performing. And I think a lot of people maybe lost a bit of trust in Gasly, going, maybe he's not this driver that we once thought he was. That everyone kind of loved Albon when he went to, to Red Bull. But since Gasly, like I said earlier, went back to Toro Rosso, now Alfa Tori, he's, he's, he's in a different level. He's absolutely yeah. incredible, which is amazing to see. I mean, I'm not, I'm not like the biggest Gasly fan in the world, but... You know, I wouldn't say I, I despise the guy. I absolutely love him. He's he's a Formula One driver for crying out loud. He's bringing loads of great entertainment. He, he's just so nice. He's so likable as well. And you know, him winning him winning on on Sunday was so emotional as well because of what he went through and losing his close friend Antoine Hubert. And it just made all it just made sense that like, if there was ever a driver who deserved a win in Formula yeah. One, he got it. And it, 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 it's absolutely it's absolutely incredible. Um, and it kind of proves this whole the car is for Verstappen because how how on earth can you go from Red Bull and achieve nothing to then go to Alpha Alpha Torre slash Toro Rosso and get a podium in Brazil and a win in Italy? He should be he should be getting that them results in the Red Bull. But when they had the switch back in twenty nineteen, uh, Pierre Gasly said that the, that the Toro Rosso car at the time was much easier to drive, and Albon said. That the car is more difficult to drive, the Red Bull. So yeah. And so, anyways, that's about Gasly about the whole whole Alpha Tori thing. Uh, him being replaced, uh, sorry, uh, avoiding Red Bull at all costs. I'm gonna keep my mind close to my, my cards close to my chest because we are gonna be discussing this on the debate show. So I'll leave my opinion for that one in the uh, for the, in the debate show and similar to. Uh, Renault uh, for him going to Renault let's say if they want a French driver Ocon being toxic I don't really know I, I, Ocon doesn't come across as toxic for me at least I mean I could be completely wrong I don't know these drivers uh, I mean Ocon's okay he's not brilliant but he's not terrible I mean he, 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 he's on a bit of form right now he's doing okay but certainly he could do better uh, beating Ricardo is going to be 
you know, it's going to be. I was going to say toxic. It's going to be tough for anybody. <laughs> toxic, anyway. Um, so, so certainly. But I'm going to say. I'm going to say agree to this. Um, for a multiple things in that, but I'm not going to say it much because, like I said, we are discussing this in the debate show this week. Um, Lyle, you there once again coming in with a brilliant opinion. <laughs> you also, you also said agree. Um, guys, you're wearing a Gazi shirt, by the way, which is. Appropriate to tie, yeah? I mean, you think that not, we planned this show? Not an accident. That was not an accident. I did this all week. I'm wearing this all week. Um, it's the only so, proof that we kind of plan stuff, which is... You're, you're yes, wearing, you're we, that. yes, we kind of planned stuff. So, obviously, as you said, uh, Jordan, of course, you know, uh, we're, we're not going to mention uh, our kind of big yeah, views on Pierre Gazi because we're going to keep that for the debate show. Um, but what I am going to discuss is the uh, do they want a French driver, a French team, uh, Pierre Gazi, of course. Um, they've got Ocon, which is great. Pierre Gasly yep. wins as well. Again, you know, you, you couldn't preempt that, of course. But Renault were, were really big fans of that, you know. Of course, a lot of teams showing their adulation to Pierre Gasly, but you don't normally get that for when Mercedes win or anything like that. So Renault share on Twitter, share on their social medias, you know, well done Pierre Gasly as well, uh, you know, on Instagram and things like that, you know, show how yep. well they're doing. They message him as well. Um, you know, you can see afterwards of the race, well, of course, Daniel Ricciardo and Esteban Ocon going up to thank, uh, say thank him, <laughs> thank you for the win, um, shake hands with him, of course, and Esteban Ocon, a close friend in, well, I say close friend, not, not really other, uh, for, you know, a French uh, compatriot going up and saying you know, well done for the uh, the, the race um, so it shows that it might be a good thing for Renault also it might be a good thing for the image as well Pierre is a definitely a very strong driver and you know yes going into the Red Bull thing he is kind of stuck in that loop you know the idea of Pierre is that he should go back to Red Bull and you think possibly not you know Renault might be the team to possibly save Gasly you know kind of throw him a lifeline you know get him out of that rip cur uh, that rip current of the Red Bull program you know he's not on that road he's he's, he's kind of like he's stuck on the motorway he can't get off you know Re uh, Renault are chucking him a you know they're chucking him an option and they're chucking him a lifeline mm. and saying tell you what you know come aboard and we'll take you from this this road because again you know and again we'll discuss that loads but now that he's won with Alpha Tari and because he's been involved with Red Bull everyone and I mean everyone and possibly us we're not going to say you know I think that he's going to return to Red Bull because he was once there maybe his route is somewhere else maybe Renault are the team that Gasly should go to and you know nothing's confirmed for next year I mean of course Alonso is but Ocon isn't as yeah. much. Of course, we are expecting Ocon to be there, be the leader of the team, the French driver, of course, but you never know what might happen. You never know what's going to happen at Alpha Tauri as well with Danny Fiat. Again, we've got other drivers in the mix. Of course, Dan Tictum and Yuri Vips doing very well. Um, and they're looking, obviously, through the Red Bull Junior program also. So they might be coming through. What are we going to do with these two drivers who were at Red Bull drivers? Of course, they're not anymore. Again, both victims of train players. I mean, Fiat and Gazi, of course, not Tictum and Vips. Um, so what are we going to do with them? Gasly might think my option, instead of, you know, hoping to go to Mercedes or Ferrari, which might not happen, is to go to Renault. So I think that's a, a good idea. And I think for Renault's sake, very much like I said for Alonso, Jordan, uh, if you remember that much, I said Alonso, it's not, you know, I, I don't get why he's coming back, but for Renault, it's perfect. Yeah. And again, with Gasly, going to Renault would be a good move for the team. And for him, I mean, you know, possibly, I mean, it might be a Ricardo-esque, he might be going there on a, on, a, on a limb. It might not work out again like it hasn't for Ricardo, of course. That's yeah. why he's going to McLaren. But it might be a good move for Gasly. So for sure, I can definitely see that happening. And that's why I agree with it. In my view, we're going to, you know, nothing said because we're going to keep it for uh, the F1 debate show on Saturday. Um, but I can definitely see it happening. And again, just adding on quickly as well, Ocon, Toxic Driver. Don't really agree with that. I do think that he's good. He does get some good results. He's Monza good. was good for him yeah. as well. Being alongside Ricardo in that in that car, in terms of is he as skilled? I would say no. We have seen a few errors from him. Remember as well his um you know what happened as well with him as uh, you know holding up uh, in the weekend. It happened in Silverstone as well. You know he's not maybe he's not as good as Gasly of course, but he is still a good driver. And of course, have a French driver in the Renault car definitely definitely helps. Uh, but I could definitely see that happening, and that's why I agree with it. But in terms of my view. We'll keep that stone for Saturday. Anyway, moving on to my final statement and the title of today's episode. Uh, it comes in from Kirill, and it's another one about Gasly, or the last one about Gasly, should we say. Ooh, Again, we saw, us, guys. <laughs> yeah, we saw a lot of people following in the same direction, but this yeah. one stands out because it doesn't. Um, and he says that Gasly should stay at AlphaTauri, even if Red Bull offer him the seat again. Um, just adding in trade places, you know, we think it's above, we think it's it's not going to happen, but there is a possibility now. 
Uh, we'll have to wait until Magello, but obviously he's saying don't go. So yes, Red Bull offer him a seat, don't take it. Alpha Tari seems a much better environment for him. And to that, and again, remember as well, as I've just said there, it might not be my view, but I could see this happen. If I can or can't see this happening, is it best for him and the team? But I'm going to say agree. I'm actually going to say disagree. Um, Obviously, Red Bull is a team that has a lot of pressure and it has Max Verstappen written all over it. So, you know, we're not talking about what did happen, but if, if Gasly was to go back, of course, everyone would be, you know, elated that he won. Everyone would expect the best results from him. If anything, he would have more pressure on his shoulders because now we, we saw him win. So, Sebastian Vettel, for sure, the definite, you know, we should be comparing him to Sebastian Vettel. Should we not? Sebastian Vettel wins in the Toro Rosso in 2008. <laughs> in, in the oh, rain dear. as well. Oh, um, no. In the rain, uh, you know, I mean, of course, it was it wasn't rain there, but you know, just showed yeah. that it was a good race for the Toro Rosso home team as well. Again, picking up the pieces when Ferrari failed in that year. So, Alpha, very, yes, I mean, to be honest, Pierre Gasly and Sebastian Vettel, very similar in that year, very, very similar. The only difference is the team name, and that one of them's French and one of them's German. Um, and then Sebastian goes to Red Bull. Again, I wouldn't say that the expectations were massive for Seb at that point, but there were pretty big. Sebastian was the next prodigy. He was signed to Red Bull in 2009 and he had to deliver. And again, we might not have seen it that much because, you know, we weren't big Formula 1 fans back then. And again, Red Bull were a team that were starting off. They were only four years old at that point. They only had Mark and DC before that. But Sebastian did have big expectations. And if he didn't win that race in China, and, you know, it could have it could have spelled disaster for Sebastian. And you never know, trade plays might happen to him. But anyway, back to Pierre Gasly. I think the expectation will be massive for him to do something. He, he'll have to win the next five races in a row that he's put in. He will have to beat Verstappen. He'll have to beat alongside Verstappen. There will have to be massive battles and anything less. We could be calling for a trade place as number four. I just don't think... the. Pr I'm not saying he can't deal with the pressure, but I'm just saying who wants to do that? Why would Gasly want to put up with all of this pressure on his shoulders and these expectations that he, might, he may or may not achieve... If he does achieve them, people will be going, yeah, well, that's good. You've won the race, Pierre. Well done. We expected you to. If he comes second, everyone's going to be calling Gasly's a terrible driver. And especially if Verstappen finishes first, it's not going to work for him. He's at a team where if he gets a good result, he is adored. And if he finishes on the top, if he, fin if he finishes on the podium like he did in Brazil, he is loved. And if he wins the race like he did in Monza, a home race, as I said, there for Alfa Tari, he is a god and he really really is well he got a phone call from president macron as well the, the president of france which again you know you don't see very much heads of state calling a sportsman to say congratulations that you know again something like that is great i saw that and i was like that's crazy um he is loved at alpha tari he really is and, and and he has the opportunity to make this his team he is the number one driver for sure he has the hold on his teammate daniel fiat he loves the team and, and the team love him. And of course, he thinks that the, the car is easy to drive. He has settled in. He hasn't been heard from the train places bug. And to be honest, why would Pierre even want to go back? You know, why would he want to do this? Is it li literally like going from swimming in a nice, safe, comfortable swimming pool to going swimming in the, the, the Atlantic Ocean? You know, is it is it? why would Pierre want to do this? I mean, of course, swimming in the ocean is better. Um, but, um, you know, why would he want to go and do this when there's sharks and Verstappen's out there that, that can get him and, and, and horrible fans? Why didn't he just stay in the swimming pool where they've got little Alpha Tari, you know, rubber ducks to play with and, you know, you can't drown, you can't do anything damaging? Um, yeah, I don't think he would. I think he needs to stay at Alpha Tari. He can make this his team and he can make a legacy at this team. And, and, and that's one thing, John, that we don't really talk about much in Formula 1 again, do we? You know, over the years, we've had drivers who they've made massive legacies with teams. They haven't jumped. Again, I'm thinking of Ayrton Senna as a big one. He hasn't jumped from team to team to team. I mean, of course, you know, yes, of course, he has moved. He's gone from Tolman, of course, all the way to Lotus, McLaren, and of course, Williams as well. But he's made, you know, legacies at the teams that he's been with. Damon Hill, another one. You know, he's not just a team hopper. And of course, Michael Schumacher as well. Um, you know, Pierre has the chance to make a big legacy at AlphaTauri. It might not be incredible. Yeah. So it might not be incredible. He might not win championships, but he's going to do better than Red Bull. I'm saying that because we've already seen that. Two podiums, one of them being a race win. Didn't get anything at Red Bull like that. I think the closest thing he got was a P4 in uh, in China. 
and then a P4 in FP1 at Silverstone. And I wouldn't even remember that stat if I wasn't there to watch it. Um, so, yeah, I think that he should stay at Tyre for sure. But that's my opinion for him. My opinion will, of course, be given on Sunday. Uh, sorry, Saturday, as we have just said. So, John, your views on Pierre Gasly, of course. Um, yeah. Race winner. It's incredible. Uh, staying at Alpha Tauri, yes. What what do you think about uh, about the Frenchman who stunned the podium for the first time in twenty four years for the country? It's incredible, isn't it? Um, yes, it helps it more, but more about Pierre Gasly. Um, being at Alpha Alpha Tauri, it has certainly brought out the best in Gasly once again. Like I like I, um, I explained earlier, and Lyle made a really good reference. It's like you know being uh, at the moment, it's like being like a small paddling pool. Yeah, yeah, being a Red Bull is like being the being in the big ocean. I like to refer it as as armbands. Gasly's got his armbands on at the moment. He needs to take them off, and then that's when he's at Red Bull. Then it's like, okay, you either sink or you swim. It's up to you. Yeah. But, and if you don't, you drown, and you're going back to that pool, um, and the armbands are going back on. Um, that's my uh, reference, anyway. But anyways, um, now being at Alpha Tori is yeah, it, it, it's really good, but they aren't a team that's going to be challenging for championships anytime soon, are they? Now Gasly needs to possibly break away from that Red Bull program. Possibly now. The reason why I say possibly is because if Verstappen does leave the team one day, let's say, and Gasly is either still at Alfa or he might be alongside him at Red Bull and he might be doing a bit better, then certainly he's going to be promoted to, I'd assume, number one. He's either going to be replacing Verstappen um, at, if he's at uh, Alfa or he's going to be promoted to number one driver. Now, if, if Gasly has a car for him that's more drivable, more better... He will win races in that Red Bull. He will do a lot better than what he did the first time. Because, like I said, the car wasn't for him. It was for Verstappen. And Red Bull have came out and said about Albon, oh, you know, the, the car's for... It, it, they didn't say it was, for, it was for Verstappen, but they said, oh, we need to give Albon a better car. So, therefore, you kind of question, well, you know, was Gasly's car a lot worse and that's why he didn't perform? Because, like I said, how can you go from... Not doing well at Red Bull, yet doing even better at, at, Alpha, at, the, at the sister team. It shouldn't be happening. Red Bull should be supporting both their drivers. And Alpha Tori, it's a small community, community team. It, it, it's a really nice team to be around. But being at, the, being at the big bad team at Red Bull brings, obviously, there is pressure. Maybe Gasly didn't do that well. Maybe the pressure wasn't for him at the time. But if you're doing badly in the car, that's not for you, and it's not suiting to your style, then you're not going to perform. So... To, for him to stay at Alpha Tori is a for his career is not a good option. Even though he's doing quite, quite okay now, quite okay now because Gasly wants to be win races on a regular basis. He wants to be challenging for championships. He needs to go further afield for him to do that. Now Mercedes is a good option. Ferrari maybe one day. Uh, Red Bull if he is the number one drive if he's alongside Verstappen no because if you put him a if you put him alongside Verstappen in that car right now you will see the old Gasly. I, you will. Um, and probably doing the same kind of level and performances as what Albon is right now. A good shout for him would be, I would say, Aston Martin would be a very, very good option for Pierre Gasly and for, for themselves. Should, I mean, it depends who they get, if they've got Perez alongside Stroll or if they've got Vettel alongside Stroll or even Vettel and, Vettel and Perez for that matter. Whoever they've got, one of those leaves bring Gasly in because... Perez isn't going to be around for very long, and neither is Vettel, if they do have one of those two in. Bring Gasly in. He would be phenomenal in that seat, even if Stroll's still there or not. I think those two could work very well together, because Stroll's not too bad, and Gasly is, you know, he's doing brilliant. And I think he could perform a lot better if he was in a different team. Even if he's in a Mercedes, could he do well, possibly, and, and elsewhere? Renault, we've alluded to, alluded to everywhere, is a really good shout. I kind of got my mind as, as where I think you should really go. Again, we'll discuss this more um, in the debate show. But 100%, like I said before, he does probably need to step back from that Red Bull, Red Bull program and not just play it safe at Alpha Tori. I don't think he wants to as well. He wants to prove Red Bull wrong, doesn't yeah. he? And even... Um, Oh, I've read this before, just, just before we recorded. Uh, one of the first guys to get in contact with Gasly after it was announced he was going to be demoted back to Tor Russell was Antoine Hubert. And he, te and he sent him a message saying, prove them wrong. Yeah. And, he, and he certainly did that in Italy, which yeah. made it even more emotional um, for, for, for Gasly, which, which is incredible. But, but no, certainly there, he, he, there, are, there, are, there, are, there is a lot of options for Gasly. Um, 
and I think Lawrence Barretto from uh, F1 F1 TV said a really good thing where this has cemented his Formula. I think it was I think either him or Buxton said it. One of them said it, uh, saying that this has cemented. In fact, I think it was Buxton off the top of my head. Um, sorry, <laughs> sorry, Buxton. Um, he <laughs> said that this is this has cemented Gasly's F1 future, and hundred yeah. percent agree with this. But like I said, we'll go into more detail on Saturday. But anyways. Moving on to the final opinion of the episode. And this comes in from Pierre Gasly. No, it doesn't actually. <laughs> no more Gasly talk. No more Gasly talk. Um, again, this uh, this guy has, has appeared on the show before uh, on Agree or Disagree. And quite ironic, his name. It is, has Sebastian Vettel scored points? No. <laughs> no, he hasn't, actually. We can actually answer this. No. And more to the point, have Ferrari scored points? No. No. no none of them have. <laughs> Sorry, Ferrari fans, but anyways... And he says a really, really good one to end with. He says, Carlos Sainz is one, one of the best F1 drivers right now. Straight off the bat, I'm going to say agree. I didn't think you would say anything that wasn't, and I'm going to agree with you, and I'm going to say agree. Now, I'm, now, I'm not going to overhype Carlos Sainz and saying that he's the best driver coming through the ranks, and he's better than Vettel. He, sorry, he's better than Verstappen. He's better than Leclerc. He's better than Hamilton. All hail King Sainz. I'm not saying that. <laughs> uh, even though I've just said it, but I'm not saying it, all right? Um, now, Carlos Sainz is by far one of the more consistent drivers uh, in Formula 1 today. He's doing a really good job. Now, 2019 was a brilliant year for Carlos Sainz. He got that podium in Brazil. He got some really good performances throughout the course of the season. Reliability did plague him at the start of the season, but as it went on and that car got better and science got better, you know, he found a home at McLaren. When he was at Red Bull, the Red, well, the Red Bull program at Toro Rosso, um, there was an uncertain future, you know, what, what's going to be happening. A lot of people thought he was going to be the guy to make that jump from Toro Rosso to Red Bull, but Verstappen was that guy. And as soon as that happened, Carlos Sainz knew there was no hope of him going to there. He went to Renault on loan, which is... It was a good car, but that's not his home. He didn't feel comfortable, comfortable there. He got beaten uh, quite a bit, some margin by Nico Hultenberg. Um, again, a driver with, with well experience and science just wasn't at home, uncertain about his future. Then it gets announced that he's going to be leaving Renault. What's what's going to be happening? And then he goes uh, in, in the McLaren. It was absolutely solid, solid job what he did last season. And this season, you know, despite it being so unreliable, he's, he hasn't had a good start of the season. That's down to the car not himself, you know, he didn't start in Spa last weekend, he got P2, very nearly won the race in Monza, so it proves how things things quickly can change, and, you know, you've got them brackets of, of different drivers in, in terms of how good they are, so you've got like these elite drivers who are, I would say, maybe Hamilton and Verstappen right now, then underneath them you've got the likes of um, Charles Leclerc, you've got George Russell, um, you could put Lando Norris in that bracket, Maybe below that you could put Lance Stroll, Gasly, Sainz, like those like kind of next level le level drivers who are, I would say I wouldn't say that you know massively apart, but I would say that certainly those type those drivers are in the mix of really good drivers. And I, like I said, you said one of the best, not the best, mm -hmm. but if you want to put that the, the best drivers in that category, like I said, you know, you've got Hamilton, Verstappen, uh, Charles Leclerc, George Russell. Um, maybe Russell yeah I'll, I'll put Russell in there anyway Sainz Gasly and, and Norris if I didn't say Norris already and and yeah you know he's going to Ferrari next season which is a lot of people are saying it's the wrong move but on the long term thing if Ferrari do have a good project I think Sainz could have a good career at Ferrari win a couple of races will he win championships I really don't know it depends how it depends what, what happens with Charles Leclerc because Ferrari might have a really bad start to the new, new, the new regs and within a couple of years, Charles Leclerc might, lo might lose trust in Ferrari and walk away, promoting Sainz to let's number one driver if he's still there. And then, who knows, could potentially become world champion if they do decide, do decide to book up their ideas. If he goes to Ferrari and beats, Sainz, uh, beats Leclerc, whew, oh dearie me, I would not like to be Charles Leclerc. Put it that way. Uh, nothing against Charles Leclerc, but you would expect Charles Leclerc to beat Sainz because he's Ferrari's golden boy. You know, he's... He, 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 Charles Leclerc is a brilliant driver, and that's going to be interesting to see those two come together and um, being being teammates. That's going to be rather interesting. But certainly, Carlos Sainz is in that bracket. Maybe you could, do you want to put him in that, in that underrated bracket? I would say this season underrated. You know, he's had some really good performances this season. Like, uh, Monza showed how good he, he how good he is fighting for that win. Nearly got it. Unlucky, so never mind. He closing that gap on, on Pierre Gasly, but nevertheless, I would say certainly Carlos Sainz is. 
one of the best drivers on the grid right now. Um, Lyle, you also you also said agree with this, and imagine you're not overhyping him yet, or you're not overhyping him as well. You know, because I know you're not really associated with McLaren, but car science, you like you like the guy, don't you? Sort of, yeah. sort of are. So, yeah, you you agree, and uh, what's your reasons why? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think Carlos is a, is a very good driver at the moment for sure. Um, one of the big reasons why I think he's doing so well is McLaren. Now, again, they of course haven't got the best yeah. car out there. But in terms of, so Jordan was talking about the team that he was with before then, of course, Toro or Renault didn't really work out. Yeah. I think with McLaren, you know, as soon as he got there, the, the, the relationship with the team, it was more friendly. It was more down to it. They were still there to, of course, you know, because, you know, before you go there, you think McLaren, of course, a very old team, haven't won since Jens Button in 2012. And to be honest, they've had some terrible, really yeah. quite abysmal years, you know. I know we, we do play it up, but they have really had some really bad years before. You know, with people like uh, even Van Dorn, Alonso and Van Dorn, uh, Van Dorn, uh, Van, uh, Alonso, sorry, Alonso and Jensen. Some of those years, you know, they're not terrible compared to like Williams, for example. Sorry, Williams. But in terms of McLaren's history, terrible. And then you got Lando and Carlos. And especially Lando, you didn't think he was going to be up to much. And Carlos as well, you didn't really know what he was going to follow. But those two have really gelled in this team. That seems to be quite a, you know, a relationship and quite a brother, a brotherly team you know a, you know they have history but they're quite young as well they've got young aspirations and they don't think they're going to be the best team they're just quite warm and, and they just seem to be the best team for Carlos for, for Lando as well and but when I talk about Lando they seem to be the best team for Carlos and very similar to, to, to Pierre Gasly at Alphatari they just seem to be or to Toros as it was then they just seem to be the best team for him for sure and, you know, look at what he's been doing. You know, Carlos isn't in the best car. Sorry, again, this time last year, he wasn't in the best car, but he got some amazing results. And, of course, his uh, podium in uh, Brazil. I know that he got it because of Lewis Hamilton. So even take even take him off the podium and just think he went from pit lane to P4 in Interlagos, which is a track which is made up of really half a straight. It's a corner track. It's a chassis track. It's a track I would say is that is made for the the old guns in Formula One, the ones who you know have the experience, the Hamilton and the Vettels, even you know people like Raikkonen do well around here. Not really uh, um, Carlos Sainz, and he gets a podium, and he proves everyone that you don't need one of the best cars on the grid to get a podium. It really yeah. was incredible, and I'd say he really found his feet at McLaren. He went from an OK driver to a great driver last year. I think he won. I think he did win driver of the year. He definitely won it for us. And he became a very good statement of 2019 with a podium behind him. McLaren have had a great start this year as well. And of course, Carlos gets a podium in Monza. In terms of getting the race win, I was I was really on the fence in terms of who was going to get it. And if, but of course, I did want Gazi to get it, of course. P2 was incredible for Carlos. Um, and I think McLaren just, again, cement themselves as a very strong team. And Carlos is... A really, really good driver. I don't think he's underrated because of what happened last year, you know, getting driver of the year and things like that. I don't think he's overrated as well. I think that he really is on the money. In terms of what he's going to achieve in the future, I, I can't say people think he's going to win multiple world championships. But of course, people yeah. are worried about what's going to happen to him at Ferrari. I mean, Ferrari are abysmal right now. Absolutely abysmal. I mean, Matteo Bernardo, I don't even know how he can walk through the streets of Maranello at night. I really don't. Um, because you know that car is just I mean wow um, so I think people are a bit worried about Carlos at the moment maybe that's why people are thinking yeah. you know kind of not thinking as much of him but he is definitely very skilled and in terms of the end of this season I'm hoping for very good things high up in the championship as well of course those McLaren's definitely creeping up as well I think the third in the constructors as well so you know that's a very good yes. statement as well of course they pulled away from Ferrari I think um, they were only a few points to go between Ferrari and McLaren in Spa, but of course, no points for uh, Ferrari, and I mean, that is a, a good haul of points, I mean, it's off the top of my head, that's probably about 40 points for McLaren and the Constructors, with of course, Carlos second and Lando's fourth, so very strong for them, so the team has definitely, definitely helped, uh, but I think he's a very strong driver, even next year when we go to Ferrari, he will be battling Leclerc, he will be showing everything, he'll be giving everything into that team, but you know, again, lest we say it about the better, we don't know how that car's going to be, it, we don't think it's going to be that good, um, at the moment, we think Carlos is a good driver, and you know we are right. He is a good driver, but 
to me, to me it, it, it's very much down to the team. It's very much down to McLaren. That's not saying McLaren are an amazing team. I'm just saying that Carlos and McLaren go together very, very well. And just a last thing as well on that statement, that's why I do worry about Carlos and I do worry about him going to Ferrari next year because I see that he is a good driver, but he is made, McLaren has made him into a great driver. Mm. And that's why he won drive the year and that's why he's doing so well. Um, you know, Check in with us in 12 months' time and see if we say that again <laughs> with him at Ferrari. Uh, because, as I said, John, you know, and obviously you'll like to hear that as well. I think McLaren have definitely made Carlos into, you know, this question now one of the great, one, not one of the greatest, one of the best, and possibly yeah. one of the greatest, but we'll have to see, yeah. as I say, what happens next. Yeah, um, but of course, a McLaren fan as well, John, you'd have loved to have stayed, loved to have, you know, loved Carlos's progress, and I'm sure you'd have wanted him to stay next year, but, uh, yeah. you know, off to Ferrari, we'll have to see what happens there. But again, nevertheless, uh, you know, as always, sorry, uh, you know, agree, agree, or disagree as well. Uh, picking these questions, it was hard because all of them are Gasly's, but I think we've got a nice, I, th I think we've got a nice little balance, didn't we? And uh, they do really sum up the reactions, the instant reactions of people after watching what was probably the most thrilling race of the year. Anyway, guys, that is where we're going to end the episode today. Thank you yeah. so much for watching, of course. And as we said at the start, thank you very much for everyone who sent in their uh, opinions for today's episode. We had a lot to come through, um, but obviously we couldn't have all the Gasly ones in from the race. We hope that you enjoyed the race also on Sunday. It was absolutely incredible. Um, uh, if you are new yeah. to the channel, please like and subscribe. We have so much more kind of coming your way, so make sure to hit that notification bell to get notified every time we upload a video. This week is the Tuscan Grand Prix race build-up. Uh, of course, I agree or disagree. Uh, today, uh, tomorrow, yes. F uh, 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 today, uh, tomorrow, tomorrow, F1 24 7 news done by Jordan should be a special one. Uh, then on Thursday, the 2020 Tuscan Grand Prix preview show, and then on Friday, we have a very special interview. We'll be re uh, revealing who that is of, on Twitter in the next few days. F1 debate show on Saturday, which We've already told you the title we're going to be discussing, Pierre Gasly. As we imagine, a lot of people want us to, and a lot of people also will be on YouTube. And then on Sunday, done by me, will be the race reaction of the 2020 Tuscan Grand Prix. The second race in Italy and uh, the Scuderia Ferrari's 1000th Grand Prix in Formula 1. The SF1000 is hoping to have a special livery. We're hoping to have some fans in there from the Tifosi, which will be in to watch the race. Even though I'm very worried, uh, I don't know about you guys, but I'm very worried about Ferrari's performance and will the actual Tifosi want to see that because if it's anything like Monza they will not want to see a double retirement no way uh, but we'll have to see what happens yeah. there so oh, absolutely thank you very much for watching today's episode let us know in the comment section about everything that we've mentioned in today's episode your opinions mm. do you agree or disagree on all six opinions and of course uh, let us know not just the Gasly one you know <laughs> that is going to be a big talking point thank you very much for watching this one guys stay safe and until next time we'll see you later